Welcome to The Liquidity Event, a show about all things personal finance with a laser focus on taxes, financial independence, and equity compensation. Hosted by AJ and Shane of Brooklyn FI, each episode will focus on a personal finance topic, some driven by news headlines, and sometimes driven by listener questions. And sometimes you'll just get two money nerds rambling about what they think is interesting. Just a quick note before we get started, this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax or investment advice. Hello, and welcome to the liquidity event. We are your host, Shane Mason. And AJ Ayers. She's back in the saddle, y'all. This is episode 120 being recorded on September 24th, airing on September 27th. Quick reminder for your listeners, we will answer your questions on the pod if you leave us a message. You can disguise your voice via talk box, use a fake name if you're shy. The link is memo.fm slash the liquidity event. How are we doing, AJ? I am doing great. Happy 120th episode of the liquidity event. We're the doing same this. age as Strider when he uh, was that in the th- <laughs> fourth age. Uh, no, I think. What is he? No, no, no. He's that's when uh, he meets Aaron, the girl in Rohan. Arwen. Arwen. Yeah, she's like, wait, that would make you eighty-seven years that old. Is. He's like, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to push your buttons, AJ. What's going Sorry, on with you? Where are you? Uh, I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, got back. I was out on the West Coast, so yeah, sorry, listeners, I missed you last week, but I heard you had fun talking about inheritance with uh, your boys. <laughs> uh, I was at a conference called Future Proof uh, in Huntington Beach, which was a lot of fun. Uh, it's like a cool financial advisor conference on the boardwalk in Huntington Beach instead of like a boring conference hall. It was fun. Good people. Basically, the theme of the conference is like financial advisors were cool and not assholes. Which is needed, right? I think that's that's much needed in an industry that's rife with uh, non-cool financial advisors and financial advisors who steal your money. So um, I would say it's a, po- a positive impact on the general world of financial advice. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. I mean, it's, I've only seen one video from the events. I, I went with you a couple of years ago. We went mm-hmm. out to Huntington Beach. And it is really fun. It's funny how that's like... Did, <laughs> culturally or style wise, like a lot of guys are still wearing suits on the beach. And then, but some, some of them are wearing shorts. A lot of shorts. They're, right. they're cool. A lot of shorts. Still mostly like, they were like, there's going to be women there this year. It was still like, mm, I'm going to go like 85% dudes, but they're trying just like everywhere else is trying. But uh, no, it was fun. A lot of fun. Uh, but I'm back in Brooklyn. Um, Today, tonight, this is going to be a little bit weird and out of order, but tonight, John and I are recording our fourth edition of the Rent versus Buy webinar, and I will be arguing why you should buy your home. Uh, so by the time this episode airs, you'll be able to watch a recording of this debate because many of our clients are thinking about this. Should I keep renting? Renting is expensive. Buying feels like it's finally within reach, but interest rates are still high. They did just come down, though, which we'll talk about. Uh, So that's going to be a webinar recording that you don't want to miss at brooklynfi.com. I'm sure it's somewhere on our website. Are you guys doing math on that pocket, on that webinar? Are you guys pulling up the New York Times calculator or do we have our own calculator at this point? There's going to be some math. We're going to look at the New York Times calculator. We have our own mortgage calculator um, on our website, which deals more with exactly what your payment's going to be um, and adds in in some fun expenses that a lot of calculators don't account for, such as air conditioning bills, uh, which leads into our discussion topic today, which is, should I buy a vacation home in a foreign city? All right, we're popping into it, getting into the articles. Yeah. So, listener, we are spending more time on the rich people personal finance subreddit looking for questions because you're probably a rich person and you probably have personal finance questions. So, since you guys don't submit them on liquidityevent.com or whatever the link is that I've read 120 <laughs> times at this point, I still can't memorize it. Uh, we are going to be answering random people's questions, and then we're going to probably post the answers now to the subreddit. Yeah, we're, 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 yeah, we're going to answer the questions on the pod, and then we're going to go back to Reddit. That was an AJ idea. I love that idea, AJ, because <laughs> this this is just like a random person asking for advice on the internet, and they're going to get two CFPs <laughs> answering <laughs> our questions <laughs> in video CFPs. format, <laughs> kind of blowing up their spot. Uh, so this is great. So this question, I'll read it, is anyone on a vacation home in Costa Rica? Are you glad you bought it? Question mark. We're considering buying one. To use as a short-term, <clears throat> short-term rental... And in five to 10 years, live there 
a few months out of the year, okay? And considering buying it now because prices are likely to continue to rise in that five to 10 year period. Wow, a lot of assumptions about the distant or the middle term future here. AJ, what nice. are your first thoughts? Uh, this question's from a month ago. There's about 20 responses and they're about to get 21. My Yeah, my first reaction is... Uh, we're thinking about using it maybe a few months in the future. So that's a lot of uncertainty there, right? That's a lot of unknowns. Um, that's a lot of, a lot can change in five to 10 years. We obviously don't know this person's personal life, but I don't make plans. I make plans for my money for years in the future, but anything about me and where I'm living and where my family's living, mm. got to think short term. Like this is not, we don't know where you're going to be. So that's my first big red flag that where this is a hell no. The other one is prices are sure to increase. Like they might, what if there's, what kind of natural disasters are there in Costa Rica? Hurricanes? I'm sure they got hurricanes. Not right. really. No, they don't. No. They, they can bend to the left. I mean, Costa Rica is kind of awesome. Have you been there? I have been to Costa Rica. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to learn to surf there. Not very well. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. I got attacked by like buggy things in the water. It was not a good experience. Buggy things? Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> uh, outdoor AJ. Sea is lice or so, it was some like crazy thing. And I came out of the water Buggies. and I was having a good time surfing and I just looked like I had smallpox. <laughs> Fearless I mirror. think they were like tiny jellyfish. I don't remember what they were. It was, it was rough. Anyway, um, yeah, I've been to Costa Rica. Loved it. Uh, ooh, fun Costa Rica, fun fact, um, which is also why you should not buy a vacation home abroad without uh, going there a bunch first. Uh, so my, f we went on this like, lo lots of the family members were there, you know, old, young, uh, to this place called Playa Langosta, mm -hmm. which I forget what we, th we thought it meant like lobsters, like that's so great, they'll be like mm -hmm. fresh seafood. Yeah. Langosta referred to the lobster sized grasshoppers yep. that populated this section of the beach. So uh, we walk in and there's like this beautiful open courtyard and my dad gets hit in the head with a grasshopper that was like 11 inches long and it was terrifying. Anyway, um, <laughs> so initial thoughts, stay the hell away from <laughs> lobster sized uh, <laughs> bugs in Costa Rica. Um, okay, I bring up Costa Rica and all AJ can talk about is the bugs. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> bugs are a huge, got, bugs are a major factor in every financial decision I make. <laughs> you know where there are no bugs? No mention of the lack of a military, and the totally, it's a totally green <laughs> ecosystem. Like they run on 100% natural resources, the beautiful beaches, the surfing, the coffee. Tell me about it. Tell, the me, tell, tell me everything. Like, bugs! <laughs> <laughs> But in all seriousness, all those things are wonderful. I'm so happy for their, <laughs> the things that you mentioned. But my, my biggest advice to anyone thinking about buying a vacation home anywhere is that you should go and rent other people's vacations home, vacation sure. homes there, not just once, not just twice, but three times. And do it in different seasons. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, typically vacation homes are not meant to be used year round because perhaps there's an off season. It's really nice there in the summer and or winter. Uh, but go spend some time there. You're going to be owning this thing. Maybe you're not going to be there in the winter, but there might be insane rainstorms that are going to flood your basement every year. You, you need to know about that. So um, do your research is my number one tip there. Yeah, that's funny. The responses to, I, I'm with you on that. I didn't uh, buy a place in Mexico until I lived here for a few years and all over as well. The, my favorite thing about these responses to this question is I had a buddy that did that, not in Costa Rica, a different yeah. foreign country. And this other person <laughs> just goes, look into Corfu, which is an island in the Mediterranean. And then somebody oh, yeah. says, uh, I'm looking at Cuba. Like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> like, just answer the person's <laughs> question, first of all. Those are totally different jurisdictions. What about, like, yeah, I'm looking for a place in Canada. Like, yeah, France is great. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what they speak the same about? language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, they're tangentially, sure. Uh, they speak the same language, surely va vastly different dialects. Uh, but yeah, Costa Rica, I, why would you look to buy a rental property in five to 10 years? Why not just invest the money for now yeah. and then five to 10 years from now buy a rental property? That's at that the point? right answer. Yeah. The, the correct yeah. answer is if you want to have a vacation home that you sometimes go to that you want to use this summer or next summer that you may turn into a rental property part of the year when you're not there, sure, go for it. You got the cash. Great. But if you're thinking about a, an event that may or may not come to pass five to 10 years from now, like do not do it. Put that money in the best place for money to grow, which is in the stock market, right? And if you're really not sure and you think the, the goal is maybe a little bit sooner, maybe it's a two to three year time horizon, fine. Put it in a money market account. Put it in a high yield savings account. I'm not going to cry about it.
Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the, yeah, it, it is a country that is kind of like a heaven on earth, kind of a paradise, especially on the West coast. But there's a lot of natural, uh, national parks all throughout the country on right now, the volcano on the East coast, uh, less surf, but more natural habitat. Um, but unfortunately the, I read recently about the cartel is now yeah, the cartels are starting is. to get involved in Costa Rica because as the market expands for drugs, uh, they are always looking for places to pop off. I think something happened in Costa Rica recently where there's more shipping lanes, like they dredge rivers or what have you. So there's more, uh, as yes. they've been bringing in more shipping cartel, people just put, cocaine and heroin uh, and fentanyl into like the bananas, the cargo right? Ships, like just yeah. build it into the cargo ship. So a lot coffee more is a big activity. export of Costa Rica, right? I drink a lot yeah. of Costa Rican coffee. Yeah, exactly. So, speaking of vacation homes in foreign countries, I actually have a cartel vacation home story uh, that's oh, yeah. pretty close to home. <laughs> so yeah. I grew up in Los Angeles and my grandparents who spent most of their adult lives in Los Angeles bought a, we could call it a vacation home. It was more a vacation shack. Uh, in Rosarita Beach, Mexico, which is about a three-ish hour drive south of Los Angeles. Uh, I spent many summers there as a kid, 4th of July. Uh, I would always get bitten up by mosquitoes. So again, bugs, big consideration. <laughs> the windows did not have screens on them. <laughs> this was more like, it was like literally like a concrete box. Like this was a, it was near the beach. <laughs> it was in this development. I think they bought it for not this a lot of money. Essentially Tijuana, right? I'm yeah, essentially Tijuana. Tijuana. Uh, they actually filmed part of the Titanic uh, in Rosarito Beach. Anyway, but growing up in the early 90s. Which, which part was that? The French scenes? <laughs> I don't know, actually. No, the, no like the ocean scenes. Like the, there was like an actual like replica of the ship. Like some of like the sh sinking sh scenes, like where they needed the water and ah. like some, I don't know. Anyway, it was a big thing. Um, pretty close to LA, cheaper pretty, in Mexico. Exactly. Big, yeah. You know, undisturbed body of water. Um, so anyway, nice little local economy. I'm sure there were drugs then long story short, fast forward to, I think when I was in high school, my dad was still going down there. Um, you know, got robbed at gunpoint a few times and eventually what ended up happening is the cartel just took over the entire real estate development and just basically didn't like rob us, like literally like stole the house and was like, this is ours now. Uh, you know, for us, for our family, it was a it was a small investment that had been made in the 70s, so it was not great financial loss. Um, but just an example of when you're not there, when you're not living in a property, um, when it's not in a place where you pay the taxes, so you don't know what's going on with the government or the local law enforcement, um, you do run the risk of break-ins, damage to your property, and in this extreme case, uh, theft of the entire property. So yes, we no longer have that property, and you can't really go to Rosarita these days, unfortunately. <laughs> That's going to be one of the worst outcomes, though, for... Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. But we we hear a lot about the best outcomes. And I think that's... We're talking about real estate a lot today and in this, on this podcast because it's what a lot of people think about. It's, it's like one of the biggest decisions you'll make. And we hear these, like, extreme stories of real estate success, which are awesome. You know, I bought... I bought this rental property in this up and coming market and it was cash flow positive within three years. I paid off that loan. Then I bought another one and now I have this real estate empire. That's a great story. I love that story. I love that for that person. But we don't hear a lot about the fails. I bought a property in a market that ended up going nowhere. That got oversaturated too quickly. I bought a property in an area that was unsafe and everyone left. The, you know, everyone stopped paying property taxes. There were, it became an unsafe neighborhood. Like we don't hear enough about the drawbacks or the extreme fails of rental real estate. Yeah, for sure. It's also a part-time job. I, I think it's interesting here that this person also says, considering buying it now, because prices are likely to continue to rise in that five to 10 year period. <laughs> what, do, what do you think about that? <laughs> right. I mean, again, like, sure, rental, I, well, I don't know what, how property prices increase in Costa Rica. In the United States, they increase at about 3% a year. They're higher in some markets, lower in others. So making that assumption feels <laughs> like you're so unsure of yourself that you have, you're like forcing yourself to make the decision now, because if it's a little bit more expensive in five years, you're not going to do it. This, uh, the person that posted this, their handle is Lux travel fan. They joined Reddit in June of 2024. Do you think this well, is like a 25 year old, uh, person that went to Costa Rica one time and is, is like, probably, I, which is money. they're exploring it. They should explore, yeah. but they should go three more times. Um, what do you think about foreign dealing with I mean, often the problem with buying property in in foreign countries where you're not a citizen uh, is that the banks are not super friendly, right? So you often have to come up with cash 
maybe you know a thing or two about this, uh, to buy <laughs> these properties as opposed to getting a mortgage. So instead of getting, getting leverage, instead of getting a mortgage through one of these foreign banks, you end up having to buy these properties for cash. What are your thoughts on that? I, I'll come right back to that. Apparently, this, this subredditor also posts on the Pivot Podcast subreddit. Okay. Uh, where Scott actually hangs out sometimes. So new subreddit for me to spend time. Anyway, uh, the, 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 yeah. So in Mexico, a little background on my house was you can get a, a, a mortgage in Mexico, but a, the Mexican economy is booming right now. So their interest rates are super high. The central bank is trying to uh, clamp down on inflation. Uh, so their interest rates are like eight, nine percent uh, from the federal uh, bank of Mexico. So the, to get a mortgage here, I had to pay like 12 percent. So I ended up just saving up a ton of money. And then the you can get an American mortgage as well. Some Americans specialize in lending abroad. The underwriting requirements are much higher for that because obviously they have less of a ability to, um, what do you call it, confiscate or take back the collateral you're dealing with multiple uh, jurisdictions at that point. So the prices are just a little bit higher. The interest rates are a little bit higher. The fees are higher. The Especially being an entrepreneur that is buying a house abroad, it got so uh, red tapey that I ended up just buying it with cash. The the mm. The super peso that was existing for a future for a few years, uh, which was just a really strong peso, when Joe Biden dropped out and Kamala came in, uh, because Trump was looking to inflate dollars, we were expecting him to win, so the dollar was really weak against the peso. And then when Kamala came in, uh, the dollar jumped up, and I ended up making like 50k in that just right when I converted that. So it made sense. I got really lucky. Uh, I can spend more time. I remember you were waiting for that for like six months. <laughs> it was literally like the, the week that I was converting all of my cash, we went from a 17 to one to oh, a nice. 20 to one dollar. Yeah. So it was really nice. So, uh, yeah. So if you're going to buy abroad, yeah, mortgages are going to be really tough, especially if you don't speak Spanish, you're going to have to hire someone locally to help you with that. You're going to feel like you don't know what the hell you're doing all the time because it's a foreign jurisdiction. You don't know the laws over there. My mom's a real estate agent. She was pestering me to get an inspection over and over and over again. I'm like, mom, they don't do them here. It's, it's not, not a thing. You, can't, yes. you cannot find someone to do an inspection here. That's an American thing. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, so there's different just building wanting. codes. Like, again, like you, of course, there are great people that specialize in this. So I'm sure there are agencies that, you know, can do their own version of an inspection and can charge us gringos a bunch of money to make us feel better about our purchase. But you're taking on pretty significant risk when you're crossing borders, both financial, mostly financial risk. What's wrong with Airbnb? What's wrong with someone else took the risk? Why don't you just take the enjoyment? If you're only planning on, on being there three months out of the year in five to 10 years, why not just just rent it? Rent it. <laughs> yeah. Rent versus buy, baby. I think I think I'm on the rent side here. Yeah, in this case, for sure, rents. I mean, I don't. But see look, I get, other, I, don't I get see the, the appeal of it as a vacation home owner. I get the appeal of it, but also you have two mortgages, you have two electric bills, you have two cable bills, you have two trash bills. It's just it's a lot to manage, and I don't think people quite fathom the the involvement of a, like a vacation home. Oh, it's just plug and play. Like it no. takes a lot of upkeep and you're not there. If something goes wrong, it's bad. You have to get up and uproot your life and go fly to Costa Rica to fix the basement flooding. Let me show you the Uh-oh. local electricity bill here oh, yeah. on my desk, which <laughs> because it had not gone paid once before, because there was confusion between the actual owner and I, they cut the electricity. Oh. And not all countries south of the border have the same level of ease of paying your bills online with an automatic right. credit card transaction that you have here in the United States. So, you know, the system is not built for foreigners to no. remotely own property and to pay their utility <laughs> bills online. It's built for locals to go down to the OXO or the local 7-Eleven and pay their bills in cash. Yep. So there are a lot of small difficulties that make it a part-time job. And then before you know it, you're hiring someone to manage everything locally. And then they might go out of business or they might not communicate you with you. They have new employees. Like I can go on and on and on about like the, <laughs> this question. This is a tough one. And this is just two sentences or three sentences posted to some subreddit uh, that we can spend 30 minutes talking about. But we've already covered it in depth. Should we move on to the next question? Yeah. You want to talk about, I mean, this is another real estate question, but there's a question about portfolio being too heavy in real estate. How do I fix this? 
Yeah, this is an interesting one. Making this as succinct as possible, which is not very succinct, but it's very interesting. I'm in my mid-30s, grew up lower middle class. Everybody thinks they're middle class. I say this all the time. Uh, but I married slash divorced someone very wealthy. Through that divorce, I now own outright a $4 million property, which is generating 170 k a year of net income. Oh, no. Uh, $1 million home slash co-ownership with the ex of a $2.5 million vacation property that doesn't get much use. Speaking of uh, vacation properties that don't get much use, why is it not being rented out? Hmm, I wonder why. Mm. A two and a half million dollar home is probably really expensive for people to come and rent out, right? Like, what do you think the rental on if it costs two and a half million dollars? Oh, yeah, at least twelve k a month, at, right? Like, at right. minimum, yeah. And how many people have that much money to spend monthly on a? rental property. Okay. Uh, all three of these are in a high cost of living U S city. I also have around 500 K of scattered income property, uh, portfolio Vanguard and E-Trade index funds, high yield savings. Wow. Okay. Uh, so they're what? 70%, 80% real estate at this yeah, point. I feel extremely fortunate, but also stuck. The income property is currently my only source of income aside from my current spouse's income. Okay. Current spouse, new income, new spouse. Uh, so I guess they're remarried now. I wonder if mm -hmm. there was a prenup, uh, involved in this place. A current spouse is making 150k. We're not into hardcore fire, but are generally frugal minded. We we're. I wonder what happened in the first uh, first marriage where they're now married to someone that's making a humble 150k. We we're planning for one to two children. My ex has expressed interest in giving up his half of the shared property in a couple of years, giving up their interest. AJ, mm -hmm. there's so many questions. Either we so would many sell questions. it, split the sale, Ooh. or he would give his half to me. <laughs> give his give. half. Right. Of, okay. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, since there are too many maybes here, I can't really make any decisions on that property yet. Things are amicable and I'd be fine with either option. You know, receiving a few million dollars from my ex-husband. Uh, I'm really I just... fine with either option. <laughs> yeah. But I, I have just... decision fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> should I just keep things as they are, question mark? Try to downsize the $1 million home and invest the difference. Wait for the potential sale. Why are we downsizing if we're planning on having kids? Wait for the potential sale of the vacation property and invest that. I just feel over-invested in real estate and it's making me mildly stress. I love mm -hmm. the number one response is sell real estate and buy more of a different asset class. Next responder is mind blown. Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sums it up, right? I mean, so, kind of. Right. Yeah. So basically reading between the lines, it seems like they're not really able to sell the vacation. And, and we hear this all the time, right? People in either it's, this is not a case of inheritance, but someone received ownership stake in a vacation property mm -hmm. that they don't necessarily want. Right. And there's more than one decision maker involved, right? Maybe they have to make a unanimous decision. We don't know what the details of the divorce are. And so maybe together they have to decide they want to sell it. It sounds amicable, but that can very quickly go south if someone wants to sell the beloved family home and the other party doesn't, right? So to me, yes, the obvious answer here is divest from at least one of these properties, put some of that money in a different asset class, hopefully the U.S. stock market. Luckily, this person it does seem comfortable with investing. They have a $500,000-ish portfolio. So that's great. Right. They're already they've already been talked out of the real estate lie. So <laughs> we have a good first step. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just reanalyzing this here. And apparently so they own outright a four million dollar property, which is netting 170 K per year of income. And their new spouse is making no, 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 no. one million. Wait, yeah, yeah I am. I now own outright a four million dollar income property which nets 170K, and then I, a million dollar home, and then co-ownership of the two and a half million dollar vacation property. So okay. that doesn't get much use. So they okay. have they have five, five million outright, and then they own 1.25 of the, they own 50% of the two and a half million dollar property. So- Okay, so sell the $4 million, million dollar property. In real estate, and then 500. So it's 12% portfolio of diversified bond, uh, you know, investments, some of it's in high yield savings, and then $6 million in real estate. So 85%, 87% real estate. So yeah, obviously, they're super over invested in real estate. But so if you sell the $4 million property right now and put all of that in the stock market, you could generate, uh, I don't know, <laughs> what, between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars 120k uh, at a 3% withdrawal rate. So yeah, so they're making 170k with the part time job and the income property all super concentrated. And yeah, they converted that I guess after tax, which is something we should discuss, right? Because 
Um, if you're going to sell one of these right? properties, yeah. yeah, if we sell one of these properties, I need to know the basis. I guess they got it in a divorce, so they would have the carryover basis from the spouse, which is probably inherited. So it's probably the basis. When, it might probably got stepped up when somebody died. Who knows what the basis is, right? It could be we don't have time to go into that. But $4 million, they should probably what? The, one of the most the low-hanging fruit in terms of excluding income from the tax man is moving into the property for two years. But then you're going to yeah. give up 170 k of income per year in the rental because they're going to get the primary home exclusion, which means them and the current spouse would get 500 k of exclusion. It's not that much on a $4 million property, right? Depending on what the basis is. Yeah. You could also get equity out of the house. I mean, what's a HELOC rate right now? Five, six percent. Really you could take, low. You could take yeah. equity out if you like. If you need, that's low your enough. emergency fund, right? I mean, yeah. It's I. I get there. The conundrum here is why. Why would I throw away one hundred and seventy in solid income? That's and without selling the asset, right? You could t- you could borrow against the asset, which is helpful, right? That's a, there's a lot of optionality there. So I see their reluctance to sell it. Um, There's just so much going on here. I mean, yeah. should I keep things as they are? Maybe. Honestly, it sounds like you're thinking about having one to two kids. Maybe when the kids start coming, that'll force a decision. Maybe you want to move to a different city that will force the the answer will come will come to you. I mean, they're making fourteen thousand dollars a month. I wonder how the other spouse feels that their new spouse is making one hundred fifty k and has fi- inherited f- half of five million dollars in real estate. <laughs> inherited yeah so i I'm, I'm doing an internal rate of return here on a four million dollar property kicking out 170k it's it's doing like six and a half percent which isn't terrible it's not bad you know if you were to sell it you know, the cap rate is 3.8 i'm not a real estate guy but internal rate of return isn't terrible so i'm it's really hard to say sell this property that's i'm more worried about it's the, hard, the yes. occupancy rate because whoever's living there is making they're they're, they're spending 15k ish per month eventually they're going to probably buy a place right like if they're going oh, yeah. to afford 15k per month yeah but hopefully you can find another tenant like it this seems has to be san francisco or new york right it's got to be right yeah for sure right and then they have a million dollar property which they want to downsize right before they have a baby i don't right I don't, that part doesn't make sense that. yeah so i guess and then they have a two and a half million dollar vacation probably that doesn't get much use that's what you sell yeah, the You're vacation property. Yeah. But also, I'm interested in this, uh, the ex expressing interest in giving up half of the shared property in a couple of years. So basically, the ex is going to be like, all right, I'm... I don't need that I've, million. I've held this, I've held on to this for too long. But at that point, if he does gift it, it's a gift, right? And I have a feeling there, his estate attorney is going to say, do not do that. Do not... <laughs> do not do this as a gift. Like, sell it. Like, why would you, why would you subject yourself to that additional headache? Yeah, if everything is amicable and this other person it seems like nobody needs this property, I think we need to sell the property. Sell the property. Sell yeah, the property. Pay the tax, invest the difference. You have a million dollar home. It doesn't say how big this home is, but I'm assuming at a million dollar home, it's got a spare bedroom. Yeah. So uh, that's a baby bedroom. And then with your one and a half, you know, one and a quarter million, who knows what happens with the family? Uh, invest that. You got a few years until you need to potentially upgrade the home to get another bedroom for baby two or three. Yeah. What else? I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, tough, tough conundrum, actually. Yeah. No rest for the wicked here. <laughs> no Where rest do for I, the Can I marry this dude? I'll get married this guy on a... In a How do you know it's a dude? Hobby. Huh? How do you know it's a dude? Uh, it, doesn't she say him? Oh, the guy. Oh, yes. Yes. The, the ex is the dude. Yes. We've confirmed the, the, gen, the gender of the... X with the, right. yeah, the other maybe, half uh, of the property. I might have implied that. I might have misogynized <laughs> or misandronized or patriarched or something or pronoun somewhere in here. Uh, my ex expressed interest in giving up his half of the shared property. Yeah. And yeah, she's yeah. having a baby. So I'm assuming that this is a, a cis relation. A cis? Could be. I don't know. Could, could go either way. Besides the statistical probability of that being what's going uh. on here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we? I have one question. Mm-hmm. I have a listener question. Yes. So not last week, but the week before you and I were answering another Reddit question and we were 
we were proclaiming the value of a 529 plan and we oh, were yeah. hyping it up so much that even if we're not going to have kids, we love 529 plans so much. And we had a listener follow-up question to say, can you speak more about that? Can you tell us why it's a good idea to do 529 plans, even if you're not going to have kids? For uh, sure. I'll do, I'll do some quick. Do you want to start? Well, just wanna, gonna, let's just like quickly beautiful. define our terms. 529 plan, college savings account, uh, typically run by the state. So whatever state you're in, you make a contribution to the New York State 529 plan. There's a beneficiary of that 529 plan who is typically a future student, but it could be you. You can make yourself the beneficiary of your own 529 plan, which is cool. Mine is currently me. I'm the beneficiary of myself. Um, what else? Uh, t- 529 plans are typically used for college tuition, um, any associated supplies, laptops, room and board, etc. Uh, that is the current use of 529 plan funds. Do you remember this Roth IRA thing where you could convert some of it? Did that ever pass? Do you remember that? There was some law in Congress. This is going to, you know, we're a little bit out the game here. Uh, there was some. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, it, yeah. There, for the sake of this anyway, all we need to know matter. is that 529 plans are for education. However, there's so much money in these things that we are, we are guaranteed to see the expansion of use of the, the use of these funds is going to be expanded beyond just college. Mark my words. Um, but If you don't use the funds for college or related expenses, you pay a 10% penalty. So the money, you don't lose the money. That would be insane. It's your money. Um, But if you decide to use the funds, let's say you sell, you, you remove all the money from the 529 plan, you pay some taxes, you pay a 10% penalty and you buy a Peloton. That's fine. All you had to do was pay the 10% penalty. Um, I love 529 plans. I think everyone should put the, at least in New York, you get a $5,000, reduction in your income at the state level. So that's a nice little couple hundred bucks tax break. Uh, everyone should do them. I think it's a great way to put your money in an account that grows tax free as the money's in there. It is not taxed each year. It is a better place to put $5,000 than your regular brokerage account. If you don't need the money for 10 years. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it all, it's all about letting it grow tax advantage, right? Cause if you put 5k in now, then you take it out next year, you have to pay a $500 yes. penalty. Yes, exactly. Right? Yes. Not for so, next year. <laughs> right. So if you take it out two years from now, maybe you've got 6k in there, maybe it had earned 20%, which it won't over the, uh, could, and then you got 6k and then you pull it out and then you put, there's a $600 penalty. So, uh, so the penalty is painful, but if you leave it in there over the course of your life, even though you pay 10% on a giant number, right? Like maybe it's worth hundred K and you're going to pay 10k in penalty. It's still going to have a higher net balance than if you had put it in your brokerage account at the end of the day. So I still remember the first time someone asked us, asked, you remember who asked us that question? Uh, should I, is it worth it to put money into a 529 versus a brokerage, even though there's a penalty? We never ran the numbers on that when we were a little baby financial mm. advisors. I remember, reading, don't do this. I like, remember reading someone else's blog post who had run, who ran the numbers and being like, Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, you fill up your 401k, you fill up your IRA, you fill yep. up your HSA, you fill up your 529 and then you go into the brokerage account. Then you go to brokerage. I'm sure. I'm missing a step somewhere in there, but generally a little that's charitable contribution. Good. If that's your flavor. Oh, my, oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I forgot charity. My bad. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so 529. So let's talk about 529 plans. So sure. I think one of the strategies we mentioned last week or whenever that was, was like what's called super funding it, right? So there's this kind of, not kind of, there's a rule that you cannot gift someone else more than $18,000, I believe is the current gift tax limit in one calendar year. So uh, instead of just doing $18,000 once a year for the next five years, let's say, Shane, you have nieces and nephews. Let's say you want to super fund their 529 plan. So instead of putting $18,000 in each year for each kid, you can basically do five years of future gifts in one year. So you could do $18,000 times five. You could do a $90,000 one-time contribution to that 529 plan, You can't give gifts to those specific nieces and nephews for the next five years, but you get to put that money in now and that money gets to grow now. That's a great strategy if you've got, let's say, like a 10-year-old, right? Yep, that 10-year-old, like you want that 90,000 in there growing now for college. You don't want to drip it in there because by the time you're done with your five years, they're 15 and they're already, you know, going to look at college camp, (laughs) they're already going to look at colleges at that point. (laughs) 
Yeah. Time is, you want time on your side. So you want to get all that money yes. rolling down the hill as soon as possible. So super funding is great. You got to weigh that with your state's potential uh, deductibility of the contributions that you're making in the state of New York. You can get a $10,000 contribution. Let's, I don't want to about the just, super funding. Can we just do away with that? Like people, I have people in California be like, well, we don't get a tax deduction in California, so I'm not doing it. Like, I don't care. The tax deduction in New York is nice. It's a nice little couple hundred dollars, yeah, but it's limited to 5000 a person. So, like, it's not yeah. a lot of money. So, like, to me, that's the tax benefit is not the little annual state tax benefit you get. The tax benefit is that the money there is invested aggressively yeah. in low-cost index funds, and you're paying <laughs> zero tax on it until you take it out. That's huge. Yeah. And I... I it's yeah. hard. It's hard to over. It's hard to overstate how important it is to hide money from yourself, right? If you put <laughs> yeah, if you put right. money in a brokerage account, <laughs> if you put money in, in a brokerage account for your kids called like college, I guarantee you that money is coming out for car, roof repair, uh, I don't know, other shit that happens in your life, <laughs> medical debt, like whatever. If you put money in a five twenty nine plan mentally that is college money can't touch it and i right. hope your kids are so smart that they get 100 percent scholarships and don't need to touch that money great well now you have an extra bonus for yourself in retirement like happy days i have one last anecdote about this about yeah. my own family yeah so speaking of time on your side when my dad passed some money was allocated to 529s for the grandkids one of them was like one years old and the other ones were like 10 years old Right. So I managed the investment, but it took a couple of years after he passed for the money to actually get moved because dealing with wills and trusts is messier than it sounds. Um, so by the time the money got invested, the kids were pretty close to college age. And so we had to go in a pretty conservative account, even though I was making contributions to these accounts for years, not a lot, you know, uh, they grew to like, they like almost doubled in size. Right. So they're going to college now, but it's not as much as mom thought it was going to be. And other mom that had the younger kid, the younger kid, because he was invested aggressively has like yeah. way more than them. And he has a lot more time to, until he goes to college. So she's like, yeah. why was it invested this way where the younger kid has more money? And it's like, well, that's how investments work. Like you need more time so that they, cause we've been on a bull market for the past, like the longest bull market right. of all time. So, and to illustrate um, why, you know, imagine if that money had gone into the market, let's say the kids were 16 in 2006. Yeah. Like we were basically, you know, and what if they had put that money <laughs> in the aggressive portfolio? Well, that money would have probably dr dramatically decreased by what? Right. 20, 25% by the time they needed to pull it out for that first year of tuition. Hello, yeah. my life. <laughs> Like it yeah. sucked for us. <laughs> like millennials caught that like horrible timeline. If you had a good investment manager, investment manager, they would have had that be in a much more conservative portfolio when they, the kid needed the money, you know, to go to school in the next two years. Um, also a good reason to have a financial advisor. Look at your 529, right? Just like see what's in there. Open it up. Also make sure it's invested. A lot of these states have shitty websites and we yeah. pull up 529 plans and that money, unfortunately, you know, your dad cash. wanted to leave a legacy and it's sitting in cash. Like yeah. that sucks. I hate that. Yeah. That is the worst. <sighs> um, you can always go to college in Costa Rica or Corfu, or wherever the bugs are. Right. <laughs> oh, so also, no, I did do this research for a client a long time ago. Um, someone was like, well, I don't put money in a 529 plan. Like I want my kids to go to like school in Italy or where, where the universities are better. I was like, fucking great. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of the universities in Italy take fucking $529. There's a huge list that the IRS publishes of all the, the colleges that take $529. Also, if you're like me and you're a psycho loser and you want to go back to school, you want to go to business school, you want to go somewhere, you can use that 529 money for yourself later in life. Like there's no, no downside here. There's a lot of things that America does incorrectly. Gun control, medicine, et cetera. There's one thing that we do exceptionally well, and that is higher education. Um, sending your kids abroad is interesting for cultural reasons, but let them study abroad. Look at the import versus export of students uh, abroad in the United students. States. Yeah. yeah. I agree uh, with you. There's one thing that we do exceptionally well, and that is educate uh, the world at, at, at the higher education level. I'm trying to think, is there anything else on 529s that we want to capture. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, prediction, I think that there's a lot of old white dudes in Congress who have millions of dollars in these accounts for their grandkids. So the legislation of $529 usage is only, only going to expand in the future. Uh, so stuff your 529s plans, kids. And if you want to super fund, all you got to do is file a gift tax return. It's really easy. Just ask your accountant. It's one little form. 
No problem. We do it all the time. We do this for clients all the time. Uh, it's with supervision. It can be very done very easily. <laughs> right on. You want to, we could talk about 529s all, all night long. Do you want all to read us out? All night long, but let's, let's go our separate ways, folks. Thanks for listening. You can always email us your financial problems or we will find you on Reddit. Email me at liquidityevent <laughs> at brooklynfi.com. Of course, you can leave us a voicemail at memo.fm slash liquidityevent. We will play that shit on the air. And finally, stands can leave us a review if they want to be weird about it. Sorry I was cursing so much at the end there, folks. Hope the kids weren't listening, but actually I hope they were because they're going to beg you for $529. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.